Mayfly time is the pinnacle for most brown trout anglers and we're pleased to announce our next Ireland on the Fly Masterclass is focusing on Mayfly tactics with international angler, guide and renowned fly tire Jackie Mann. On Thursday the 25th of April at 8pm, Jackie will be discussing how to make the most of the conditions, the best flies and methods to use, as well as giving his tips and insights from a lifetime of experience. So, to join us for this masterclass on Thursday, 25th of April, just go to www.irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass. Tickets cost 10 euros and all attendees will get a copy of Jackie's notes as well as access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And stay tuned for our masterclasses throughout 2024, covering salmon, rivers, locks, streamers, lures, dries, everything to make you a better salmon or trout fly angler. Helping you to catch more this year, and to learn from the best. For more information, email us on info at irelandonthefly.com. Well, that was interesting, wasn't it, Dara? Always nice to hear what's going on up in Scotland. And I think what, what they're planning for the River Dee is, is brave and, and progressive. And if, it, if done correctly, could be a, could be a real example of, of what the future might hold for these Scottish rivers. Yeah, it's the action. It's the proactive measures that have been taken. I think that's what's heartening for anglers. You know, when we spoke to Robert Mitchell, the Spay Gilly, as part of that episode, you know, you could hear the despondency. You know, he said how they're fearful for the day that is, you know, will there be no salmon left? But then you have Colin saying, well, there's targeted measures that we're trying to do. And Colin, of course, was positive. He was the glass half full man when it came to the future of the salmon. I, I think so. I think my takeaway from, from that, and what was really heartening, I think, was, was Colin saying he doesn't believe the salmon is going to go extinct. He doesn't believe we're going to lose it, at, at least in our lifetime, if ever, because he believes that that fish is so resilient, so uh, such a, an, an evolutionary marvel of a species that it will outwit the challenges that it faces and, and live to fight another day. And that to me was incredibly heartening. I think maybe, maybe as an angler, I'm a little despondent as to, as to the numbers we, we might be looking at, but as a lover of the king of fish, it was an incredibly enthusiastic episode, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. Now, maybe for anglers this season, we mightn't see the turnaround on the bank. Uh, this, but you know, this is long term stuff. So again, look, let's let's keep the heart and keep the faith for that. Speaking of actions and being proactive, this week's guest is one person who really has shown what can be done. We're going to go from the freshwater to the oceans, and he has shown in terms of influence, money, talking to governments, talking to politicians, what kind of change you can uh, impact. He gets things done, doesn't he? There's no messing with Charles Clover. He's, he's a well-connected, well-backed, incredibly erudite, educated, learned, passionate activist, I think. But, but he's so much more than that. He heads up the Blue Marine Foundation, now one of the leading lights in, in marine conservation. He's also an author, isn't he, Dara? He is. He wrote Rewilding the Sea, amongst others, How to Save Our Oceans, a book we'd highly recommend. Uh, it's, he just talks about the kind of stuff that the Blue Marine Foundation has done, whether it's around the waters around the UK, whether it's waters in the Southern Atlantic, just what they've done in terms of protecting certain areas, how they've gone about doing it. And I think, again, for people who read this, again, it fills you with hope. You read this and go, it's worked here. It can work in other places too. Exactly. And more recently, they've been in the news because they are taking the UK government uh, to court. They're suing them for enabling overfishing. I know that's a case he's been working on personally for quite some time. And if, if they win that case, it will be it will be revolutionary when it comes to the overfishing and the super trawlers out in our waters. So watch this space. But of course, it all started, didn't it, Dara, with Charles stood in a salmon river in the 80s and learning that this fish isn't coming back in the numbers that it should. So let's jump in and hear what Charles Clover has to say. I mean, I got into marine conservation because I was a salmon fisherman. I wanted to know why the salmon were returning in fewer and fewer numbers. And that's, that was from the 80s onwards. I caught a very large salmon and the, the, the very large salmon didn't keep coming. And I researched how those large salmon had uh, failed in the, the 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 early 1900s and had been reseeded in that salmon river um, uh, rather successfully. And how these huge Norwegian strains of, of salmon came back to the Welsh Dee 
uh, it was cyclical and they 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 were very big and some of them were in the 40 40 odd pound salmon and then um you know the the, the 60s came and the, the the salmon disease and the netting and so on and so there were there were cyclical problems we've had these problems before um and the salmon has gone on coming back but it it, it is now in a in a greater decline than we've seen a long time I, I i don't honestly know um enough about the salmon's biology because i've been concentrating on other marine biology for so so long um i don't know i don't have particular theories that that, that you won't hear from anybody else but um you know it, it, what needs to be done is to break down all the various component parts of what this migratory fish uh, of the life cycle of this migratory fish, and, and and something seems to be attacking all of them at the moment, whether it's you know sewage in uh, the southern English rivers or or or, or temperature in the uh, temperature booms or blobs as they're called in the Pacific in 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 in, in the North Atlantic, so it, it's it's challenged by by temperature by pollution and by fishing activity which is the most important i couldn't tell you but all of these things will need looking at if we are going to save the salmon it, it's recently been um i guess certified by the scientists that the uh the voring plateau do you know off sweden up there in the sort of north sea norwegian sea north norwegian sea um is where a great majority of the salmon go uh to feed because there's a huge ups upwelling there um, multi-species fish but it's because of that it's it's littered with industrial trawlers now it's very difficult to prove that they're catching the fish as bycatch um, but we have reason to believe that they are and obviously if you it, it, the numbers being as they are for the salmon if you catch i don't know uh, even a hundred mature uh, fish you could be wiping out a, a huge swathe or even a whole generation of, of a river's uh, returning spawning fish uh, with the with the experience you've had with industrial trawlers, um, what might you offer um, to NGOs or campaigners or activists alike uh, in order to bring attention and pro properly prove this this theory? The availability of forage fish is very important in the salmon's life life cycle. The availability of krill over in uh, um, uh, uh, towards Greenland. Um, where they go. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't distinguish between temperature and fisheries here. I think that temperature is undoubtedly a problem, that that, that certain um, birds and forage fish uh, do not thrive in, 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 in warm temperatures. And that's something that's going on in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. And the, there will be less fish there will be less uh, food for for the, the the salmon at certain times because of that temperature. I think you have to assume that's the case. Nobody seems to really prove that 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 industrial activity for either forage fish or uh, pelagic trawling activity is really uh, uh, having a significant impact upon smelt migration, which is what. I think certain people have set out to find the Atlantic Salmon Trust and others with all fishing activity and spawning activity. Um, it's a generally a good idea not to have fishing on it during the foraging or breeding seasons. And so um, there are no, as far as I know, marine protected areas for salmon alone. And actually, funny enough, the Russians were thinking of having one um, a few years ago, never did. Um, and 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 you know that is one of the one of the tools that we have found very useful in in the world um, for um, improving the the, the 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 productivity of of lots of uh, lots of fish. Um, you know, if you can identify somewhere where where the salmon are for a, a lot of the time. And prevent people fishing for them or or fishing for their uh, their forage species i mean that that is a thing that's not been done i don't know whether it would work in the salmon's lifestyle but a uh, life cycle but um it 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 it's a thing that 
it, we do in every other aspect of things. And then then there is fisheries management, and that that, that run that's in the sea. I mean, obviously, the the biggest problem the salmon seems to be facing is in the sea. But you know, I do wonder. I do wonder. Um, from the first time I actually got interested in this as a as a subject back in the eighties, when David Solomon wrote a paper saying that the that the problem of the Welsh uh, the the why the Herefordshire why that which used to have produces enormous sort of forty pound salmon um, the the the, the uh, extermination of the salmon and the why was really largely down to people with rod and line. Now you do have to wonder whether us fishing less because there are fewer salmon uh, might actually be a good thing. Um, I'm afraid um, maybe we were fishing too much. I mean, it, we have to look at all. Or, uh, we have to look, you know, completely, um, honestly at all forms of exploitation of the salmon, and and whether or not we're taking too many, or or or, or as the the world is these days, returning them with catch and release. But are we doing it properly? You know, what are the what are the reasons for salmon mortality um, that we can affect? I mean, there seems to be an awful lot that we can't. If we were to broaden it out, um, Charles, and maybe just to paint a picture for people about the oceans in terms of the overfishing, uh, in terms of the, the subsidies that don't work, in terms of the long distance trawler fleets um, that are, you know, dredging the oceans, you might just give us an overview and just kind of paint that picture in terms of the collapse of fish stocks, the effects this has had, and you know, like I said, the EU fleet, the Chinese fleet, um, how these are just essentially hoovering up uh, just massive um, numbers of fish all over the world. Well, uh, the global picture, as, as the UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization um, a, a rather um, euphemistically puts it every year, uh, or every other every couple of years, I mean, it is, it does a, it's a state of world fisheries, um, is that 90 over 90 percent of of marine fish are, uh, are either fully or over exploited so overfishing is a major problem in the world um there are uh countries that uh, are not always the countries you think um either that that manage their fisheries relatively well um the united states with the ex Exclusion of the uh, exemption of the uh, uh, probably the east coast where it hasn't done very well um, has has a very good law uh, it does does within its own waters pretty good job I don't think the EU does and and uh, the EU doesn't do a very good job um, in distant water uh, circumstances either because it has a uh, a distant water fleet that catches tuna principally that uh, behaves quite badly at times and does overfish other people's oceans and and where it, it has no uh footprint on the, the coastal area so you do wonder whether this is just a completely colonial exercise um but the greatest colonial fleet in the world today is is chinese and it's somewhere over fifteen thousand vessels and the chinese belt and road um uh, uh, imperialistic exercises has receives far too little attention, and uh, some of these uh, Chinese vessels are now sort of uh, buying their way into other countries, so they become even harder to spot and harder to do anything about. Um, that's assuming that they're behaving badly, which they don't always do, um, but there are uh, there is a basic uh, exploitative um a thrust by by china which feels very strongly that it is it needs to feed its billions and quite understandably but it is doing uh, various reprehensible things in terms of salmon where uh it is uh catching uh forage fish off the coast of africa the sardinellas and so on and and putting them through uh, fish meal plants whereas they were previously uh being these were low grade low low um price fish that were being sold uh by and to the local population so the the collapse of those west african fisheries is another reason why you see um uh inflatable boats trying to uh, uh, kind of cross the mediterranean 
uh, with with migrants or indeed the English Channel. I mean, some of these people are from Senegal, where uh, they have nothing left, and and the, these imperialistic fleets, frankly, should be stopped. And 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 it, it is a a, 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 a noble uh, a quest to try and make that happen. But realistically, um, we have to deal with the Chinese, and we have to. Uh, deal with the the international fisheries regime. The the, the 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 things, the levers that we possibly have, which are still um, slightly intangible because they're not uh, yet fully agreed to after a very long time, are the subsidies regime, which um, the World Trade Organization has tried to do something about. And for the first agreement it that seems to have actually made in twenty two years, is a is, a, is a, an agreement to reduce fisheries subsidies. How that affects um, China and how it affects the EU, which doesn't think it applies to its fleets. Ho ho. Um, I don't know. Uh, everybody uh, who signed up to that uh, in 2022, every country that uh, still has to agree it in a formal way, that hasn't happened yet, and that the language needs to be improved. It doesn't appear to apply to 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 fuel subsidies now. If you look around the world at, at fuel subsidies, uh, there's a lot of it going on. Um, the Chinese are up to it, but and you know, if you look at what Britain is doing, um, it's quite extraordinary. I don't, I don't think anybody has actually uh, publicised this yet, but uh, a, an expert group um, looked at the fisheries subsidies um, that the UK um, uh, 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 gives its own fishing fleets, and they are quite extraordinary, um, and they are far greater than the government thought they were at the time of these uh, uh, World Trade Organization negotiations, in which Britain, like America and other people, has this very virtuous line that we shouldn't subsidise fisheries. Well, if you look at what Britain does, I mean, we are giving something called fuel tax concessions. Now, uh, you know, fishermen get cheap fuel, get the uh, fuel. With the with the tax knocked off, um, a bunker fuel, uh, red diesel with the with the the, the the tax knocked off, like fish like farmers do, but they pay even less than farmers. Farmers pay eleven p tax. Fishermen pay nothing, and and the 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 distortion that this causes in our fisheries towards the more industrial forms of exploitation is quite dramatic because you wouldn't be able to run uh, a scallop dredger or a uh, a beam trawler or a nephrops trawler in the north sea and all of these operations are, are, are technically you know destructive they are destroying seabed literally habitat. like plowing up the, the, the seabed like a farmer would plow a field uh, it's like harrowing a yeah. field yeah exactly um and so we are we are paying, we are subsidizing people to harrow our seabed. This is crazy. And these activities, uh, I am told, would be bankrupt, would not be viable if we weren't giving these subsidies. And the subsidies, the, 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 these tax concessions, these tax breaks amount to um, somewhere between 150 and, and 180 million a year. That's about a fifth of the um just under a fifth of the total turnover of the fishing industry that's crazy we are subsidizing by a fifth of the actual value we're getting back uh various activities that we don't need to exist at all and which are destructive where's the public good in that is that an overhang charles is that a sort of archaic overhang from some from something that we're, a regulation that was implemented decades ago I think it's just been a natural assumption since the war that, and before that, that the fishermen were doing a good thing. Mm. They were providing food, and like farmers, they needed to be able to do it as cheaply as possible because we needed, you know, after the collapse of, of 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 the economies of Europe in 1945, we we wanted cheap food, and nobody's re-examined it ever since. I mean, we've ex re-examined dig for victory, but we haven't re-examined cheap fish and and fish evidently isn't cheap mm. um it evidently isn't feeding 
the the urban the urban poor, um, at least uh, not the fish we catch. We've overfished the fish we catch. We import fish from Iceland and Norway, and occasionally Russia, um, pre-Ukraine war, um, which we actually feed ourselves in our in our fish and chip shops. Where whereas we export most of what we catch in the way of langoustines and scallops and so on uh, for a lot of a lot of money to um, other countries who pay even more for it than we do. So there isn't a food security argument anymore for this subsidy. So we need to re-examine that, as, as you quite rightly pointed out. How would, you know, you know D- Dara and I were discussing before we jumped onto this conversation that there is an increasing call uh, for, for citizens for citizen scientists, for activism, for people to get proactive as government become as apathy becomes increasingly the enemy and 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 corruption and all the rest of it is, is coming to the fore and politics in gen- in general. How do we go about actually forcing this change through, which is so obviously needed? Support the right organisations, I think, because you can't. Nobody can do this on their mm. own. Um, uh, uh, we um, set up an organisation. Um, 13 years ago on the back of a film that we made, which is quite successful called the end of the line Great film. And everybody said, well, why don't you, why don't you set up an organization? Um, because the ones in this field aren't doing enough. Well, whether or not that was true, whether there's people's perspective, perception was, was right though. It was fairly uncrowded field at the time. And so we set up the blue Marine foundation. We tried to do things. Um, and after 13 years, we now have the, capacity and and the fundraising ability to actually do some of them at the beginning we didn't so organizations uh, 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 non-governmental organizations need uh, cherishing they need funding and they need supporters and we can't all do this ourselves um so that's one thing that needs to be done is 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 have a very uh a, a, a flourishing third sector, which is not the government, which is holding the government to account, which is saying, well, don't you think there are some solutions here which we could all work on together? That's what third sector is meant to do. And and we're doing it. So um, we would we will su- suggest strongly that the, the subsidies, for example, are really not the way we should be going in the world of the Paris Agreement and uh, climate change and the biodiversity crisis. These are subsidies that are militating against that. Everybody else is having to do something about their fuel use. Why shouldn't the fishing industry? But there's an even fun, more fundamental um, and interesting uh, thing that we can do about it uh, going on right now, um, which is that after this curious thing called Brexit, Britain is actually making its own laws in a rather sort of timid way um, for the first time in 50 years uh, or even longer um, in in, in fisheries terms. And and it's not at all clear that the laws either are right or that they are delivering the outcomes they're meant to deliver or that they're meant or that they're looking after um, our national uh, resources our national natural resources in a responsible way that you would have to do with oil and gas or with any other commodity that uh, the public owns so we um are particularly uh, 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 annoyed that the government continues to allow allocate fishing opportunities above scientific advice Something like 65% of all fishing opportunities last year were allocated by scientific advice. Uh, in 2023, it was 57%, nearly 60% above scientific advice. This is crazy. That is overfishing. That's institutionalized overfishing. Now, I don't think that's even legal uh, according to our own new Fisheries Act, which has been carefully written so that nobody can judicially review the government or hold ministers to account, because that's what civil servants like to do, to keep their ministers safe. But we don't even think that it is safe, that they are safe. And we don't think that that is a justifiable thing to do with uh, with, with fish, which are well, the right to fish is actually the property of the crown 
on behalf of the people of Britain. Um, who, it, uh, who the right to fish is owned by in the European Union? I'm glad you asked me that question. It was so confused that nobody was able, nobody, no owner was able to complain. Um, but people, um, notably in Ireland, have uh, got their heads around this one and uh, a complaint to the European Commission that overfishing is happening. The, the Friends of the Irish Environment and Client Earth uh, have a case, which has got as far as the European Court, which uh, and has got as far as a, a, an advocate general ruling that says that the, um, the, the, the Council of Ministers have no discretion, none at all, to allocate fishing opportunities above scientific advice because their 2013 reforms of the common fisheries policy say explicitly they must not, but that's what they've been doing. So that, that court case is a jolly interesting one going on in Brussels. And we, uh, Blue, um, decided that we should have an equal and opposite case in the very different law that now pertains in the UK to see whether we could um, uh, at least uh, identify the responsibilities of ministers in this regard as to whether or not they should be looking to get the maximum public benefit um, from their natural resources or whether they were allowed because of the special pleading by the fishing industry um, in of a very short-term nature um, to go on allocating fishing opportunities that ran the stocks down. I mean, we have, exa for example, this year, we have a couple more. I mean, it's depressing to say this. We have a couple more um, zero tax total allowable catches. The, the, the way that these things are set out by scientists, by uh, the, by ICC, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which regulates, well, sorry, which doesn't regulate, it, 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 which advises um, scientifically uh, the European Commission and, and the UK government and Norway uh, in the Northeast Atlantic. The way that these recommendations are set out is uh, in the form of the, the, the recommended total allowable catch. Well, we've got a couple of zeros, a couple of new zeros in the UK waters. One is the Channel and Celtic Sea Pollock. I think another one is the uh, either the place or the or the soul in the in the Celtic Sea. Celtic Sea is very hammered. Um, and and this we've we've got this crisis at the moment. Um, the the Mavigasi trawlerman, um, a, a, a netsman in in Cornwall, quite rightly saying. Oi, you know, you're going to put us out of business um, if you stop us catching Pollock. But if you look at the figures, we've been allocating um, catches to them, allowing them to catch more than scientific advice um, since the 80s. This is a very long, you know, slow motion accident. They could have complained a lot earlier that they were being allowed to catch too much. Uh, but they're now complaining they're not going to be allowed to catch anything at all. And I have some sympathy, but not that much sympathy because they were complicit in this and they only complain when they're not allowed to catch what they want to catch. They don't complain when they're being allowed to catch too much. But you went from just writing about problems to actually doing something about it um, in terms of setting up the Blue Marine Foundation. Was it just, I just want to take it back a little bit, was it to, the, to that period for you yourself, was it that just writing about it wasn't enough anymore? You were so passionate about the issues that you were seeing, you didn't think they were being dealt with in the right way. Was that such a strong draw for you that you felt impelled that you had to go set this up uh, and kind of move on from journalism? Well, I'm still a journalist, really. Um, I, I just use it in a different way. Um, and my, you know, my campaigns are, are projects and, and, and my projects are campaigns. But um, I suppose I, I was a specialist journalist. I was an environment editor for a long time. And so my focus just narrowed. Um, I, I, I wrote this book, it was quite successful. And I wrote this, uh, 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 the script of this film, it's quite successful, which led on. And people said, well, would you like to solve the problems that you've been writing about all this time? It wasn't that I, I thought I would. I didn't know there was an, even a remote possibility that I could. But if you put one foot in front of the other and, and go in the direction that people 
seem to want you to go in and which you'll be very happy to go in yourself um slowly we have built this this structure and and we have gone from being a small charity to a medium-sized charity with all sorts of headaching um uh, reporting requirements and um hr policies and god knows what that you have to have these days just because we just put one foot in front of the other and we did actually seem to be succeeding and uh bouncing governments into doing good things that they wouldn't otherwise have done how is it because when you read the book rewilding the sea where you talk about the access to the corridors of power in terms of getting ministers to sign on for what you were trying to do in terms of the marine reserves how, like you were able to knock on the doors and you were able to open those doors or at least have uh, sympathetic ears to listen to what you were saying what was the secret to that well, I knew all these people, I suppose. I mean, it wasn't just me, but um, you are people who know the people and you know the people. So um, it does help to be from the business of journalism because you're sort of in the middle between the conservationists and the fishing industry and so on. So, you know, for a while, until you become a strident uh, environmentalist and attacking the industry, um, they will listen to you, whereas they wouldn't uh, listen to other people. Uh, and you have a certain sort of track record that they'll listen to as well, of, of, of looking on the one hand and on the other with the industry. And then with the politicians, you know, you if you're a prominent journalist, they you know them and they know you. And so that position, I suppose, that was a position where 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 Blue Marine Foundation did have a little bit of the edge compared to other marine charities perhaps because we were right in the thick of it we were you know we, we were based in the center of london a, a five minute walk from parliament and and a five minute walk from the law courts and you know a 10 minute walk from the city so those that 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 sort of access was was very important to us rather more so than the you know the usual sort of academic um marine biologists who have formally set up charities because that's not their world so we needed the marine biologists but um that was our world and so that's where, why we had access because people we knew them would you consider yourself now or would you be considered a, a strident environmentalist or or do you still have the ear of of those in power as much well i think you as ever um uh, the best you can do at any time is is have the ear of some of the people in power who have to argue with their colleagues. So uh, there are one or two people in power who, um, uh, in this government or or any future government, who we would know, and we would um, try and try and say, well, you know, these are the options available to you. Um, which you want to do? Which you which do you think you can get away with? Which do you think? Um, um, you might be able to achieve in your term of office, or is it just too difficult? I think our job is unlike, and I have to constantly tell myself this, is not saying, you know, this is all wrong uh, and the following people are to blame, which is what I did as a journalist. In, in, in this world, um, as I'm constantly being reminded, you know, the job is to package up the problem say that the, 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 the solutions um, do exist and these ones are politically achievable now and why don't you take the credit for doing them <laughs> that's that's the job and so you know banging people over the knuckles and uh and shouting and screaming is not really something that i find very productive to do yet people have to be told that certain things uh, <laughs> subsidy regime are completely wrong and it's time, but, but you know, historically, you know, who's to blame? But let's just try and let's try and uh, edge our way around this and 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 do it better next time. So, so, in essence, you're you're doing their job for them. You know, instead of just reprimanding them and holding them to account as politicians, ministers, as regulators of our country, you also have to offer them solutions that they should be looking at themselves. It sounds that they can take credit for. <laughs> That they can then take credit for, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Fred, that's what you have to do. I mean, wh whether it's uh, and uh, proposing that 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 Britain should actually put marine protected areas around all its um, 
overseas territories, which I was responsible for doing at one point, and now very successfully is is the largest network of marine protected areas on Earth, uh, the Blue Belt. Um, we did we did we did suggest to the government that it could do that, that it would be it wouldn't cost it very much, and it will get an enormous amount of credit by doing that. And uh, David Cameron's government, as it ha happens, <laughs> ironically, um, decided that yes, he would do that, and and um, that was an example of of offering them a solution. They probably uh, in power didn't have the time to be ambitious enough to to conceive for themselves, which was entirely doable, and has brought about a great result. But you know, there are other examples of us of, of us trying to do that. It's about a lot of it's about setting the ambition for politicians, which they don't really have time to, if, if they didn't go into um, a government with that ambition, um, it, it's, they're, they're then pummeled and punched by 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 uh, 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 um, events, as as uh, Harold Miller would call it, and and events are a terrible sort of. Uh, traumatizer they can't think they can't do anything they have to just do the immediate day to day and so somebody wandering in saying well here's an ambition that you might want to have i don't know whether you do or not um but it, it is possible to achieve this now very necessary thing and here's how you do it and here's what it costs and uh and here's how much opposition you'll get for it and you make the decision so that's how i i try to package everything up these days that's great advice, isn't that fantastic advice? And and everything something we knew, but to hear it to hear it firsthand like that is invaluable. Yeah, and I, I think Charles, obviously, with your work as the the journalist, um, you know, you you were at the corridors of power. You saw how they worked. You knew what buttons to press, I suppose, and that kind of helped then in terms of your subsequent work with the Blue Marine Foundation. Just tell us, um, you mentioned the Blue Belt there, um, Charles. What's some of the um, examples that you're most proud of in terms of the successes with the Blue Marine Foundation? Well, um, it probably has to start with uh, these huge um, uh, MPAs around uh, British overseas territories, because that's where we got in. We came, we 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 started with the Chagos, which was uh, an obviously ve a very vexed territory. Um, the Britain had ejected its, expelled its population. Um, nobody really wanted to touch it, um, but there was a huge opportunity to not only protect its waters, but to, to create a precedent that rolled out across um, other people's um, far off islands. And and that was actually what was utmost in my mind when we when we did it. But um, other the whole you know uh, fifteen years of campaigning by other charities had um, had led to the past where. The, uh, uh, a marine protected area was proposed in the Chagos, but uh, as as in the as the election loomed in in uh, 2010, um, the 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 Labour government was pretty much skint and had no money to do it. So our only contribution to that particular solution was to spot that this was a huge ask. This if you in in terms of a of a of a of a of a selling point, you know, would you like your name on the biggest marine reserve ever created? Was it was a very attractive bauble for a very rich man or woman, and and we thought we could find one in the time available, and we did. So having done that one, it it it, it then took five years. Um, to and by the way, the Chagos, the British government has now decided it isn't giving the Chagos to Mauritius. I gather that things are moving pretty fast uh, in that direction uh, as well. Um, but um, and then you see, having created the pr principle that that, that um, there should be uh, a marine protection around these what used to be called fragments of par paradise, these, these extraordinary places which were were were, were uh, Part of the British Empire, but then given some self determination, but could not actually become independent territories because they were, in most cases, too small. Though in Bermuda's case, it's still arguable. Um, these 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 fragments of of of, of paradise 
should be protected. There were no obvious fleets in most cases, except Falkland, uh, where they just make a lot of money out of, uh, out, of, out of licensing foreign fleets. But in most of these cases, there was no indigenous fishing industry, was, um, and 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 there was no reason to fish them. And there was a there was a good reason to protect the environment for tourism and for the future. Uh, and 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 so that case, when it was properly made. Um, was persuasive, and uh, five years later, we managed to get a um, a Cameron government to protect. Uh, in the first instance, thanks to American prompting, um, uh, the Pitcairn Islands, and then uh, ascension, and then to package the whole thing up and call it the Blue Belt, and that's that only applies to those uh, self-determining uh, countries that uh, and, uh, and islands. Uh, Territories is what I'm trying to say. The self-determining territories who want to be part of it because it, with it comes funding for marine conservation objectives. But more and more, including the Caribbean in the Caribbean now, um, are joining up. So it's quite a sort of big thing in the world. The the um, the, 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 the 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 blue belt. Well, I was going to say, Charles, um, Lime Bay. Yeah, Lion Bay, because the, in- the interesting thing, actually, Jim, between, say, Lion Bay and, say, Ascension and all these places, it's the buy-in of the local people, isn't it? Yeah. Marine conservation tends to be a sort of bottom-up and a top-down thing. If there's too much top-down, the locals don't like it and, and revolt against it, and that's happened a couple of times in Scotland, once quite recently over highly protected marine areas where everybody got the wrong idea and they said it was the same as the, the, the Highland clearances and other such utter nonsense. And, and 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 conservation was set back maybe 25 years. But so you don't want to upset the locals. But we perceived that, that was there was a danger there when um quite splendidly and in a in a, 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 a an entirely enlightened way, the last Labour government in the UK um banned trawling in this area of great uh, biodiversity in Lion Bay, where the the, the actually it was a scallop dredges is a dredging and trawling. So the dredges were were, were basically harrowing the the the, the 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 corals and and sea fans of of Lion Bay, which which deserved to uh, deserved a life, and and um, and the the local fishermen supported the local inshore fishermen, static pot, potting and netting fishermen supported a ban on trawling and dredging and and having supported it the government declared a ban and then just sort of walked away there was no benefit for those fishermen um and the recovery took a long time there to happen it did happen in the end and now we've got four times the amount of species four times the amount of commercially harvestable fish because of uh the benefits of not trawling or dredging so um, it's come good, and and what's come even more good is that the we've literally come to the end of our project, and we've handed it back to the 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 the, the, the fishermen. They have set up a community interest company, which has many of the objectives that we all agreed on um, in, over the course of that eleven years or something um, to 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 promote conservation. So here we have a community interest company promoting conservation run by fishermen. Result. So. Um, that that's that's how I'd like to do it. I'd like to see that r- proliferated everywhere. Um, there are lots of community interest companies. Some of them work, some of them don't. The more the the local people, the more fishermen you have on the board, the 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 better they work. We were just talking, weren't we, Dara? Is yeah. the artisanal angle, uh, which you talk about in your book so well. Um, if we can reintroduce a more yeah. artisanal way of fishing, uh, local communities looking after themselves, run by themselves, uh, then that that's a really positive and progressive move. We, we, we're dealing with wild animals here. We're not dealing with um, you know industrial production. You, you, wild animals need to have that space to reproduce and and breed and and um, and uh, migrate and so on. That. That industrial fishing methods just don't allow them to have, and industrial measure, methods are driving down fish populations everywhere. The future is artisanal. Can I though challenge you on that, Charles? How realistic is that? You know, we mentioned the Chinese earlier. We mentioned the EU long distance fleets. You know, the demand is soaring in terms of the grow, growing global population. 
we know what governments and politicians are like. We know what it's like. You know, we've covered um, aquaculture, fish farming um, on this podcast series in terms of the multi-billion dollar industry that it is. How realistic is it to expect or to hope that we can return to artisanal fishing? Well, it's obviously going to be a different kind of artisanal fishing. It's going to have to be much safer. Uh, It's going to be technologically much more advanced. But there's no reason why we shouldn't catch the fish that we're currently catching by much more artisanal, high-tech artisanal means. Um, And there is, you know, there are some bads, some public bads that we need to, to grind out of the system, notably you know, very heavy machinery drag it, dredging up the seabed, which also uh, damages our uh, ability to, to damage the ocean's ability to, to soak up carbon. Now, that's that's going to have to stop. The amount of fuel they're being subsidized to use and the amount of uh, seabed they're damaging means that what they're doing is no longer perceptible as a public good. If you, you first do no harm, and you'll find that, yes, we are fishing in what you could call an, a more artisanal way. What I found fascinating in your book, Rewilding the Sea, was while I might be skeptical in terms of our ability or the politician's ability to um, downgrade you know, industrial fishing, is the actual benefits that you see in terms of carbon capture that you mentioned, like there's the IMF report on the value of the whales. That if you increase, yes, absolutely, like if you increase the, I'm just off top. If you increase the population of the whales to was it four and a half, five million from one point three million as it currently stands, you're capturing the CO two equivalent of Russia's annual CO two emissions. We nearly need to frame, reframe people's minds in the sense of by preserving this, we're actually <laughs> for the future, we're actually taking out the damage kelp forests as well you know let's slap preservations on those let's encourage those to 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 come on it's but but it's a real that was a real eye-opener for us charles the the carbon offset um that that can be implemented uh, that goes hand in hand with industrial fishing or artisanal fishing or whatever or our seas in general that is really something that sounds like we're we're at the beginning of and could be a really really powerful argument going forward i think it will be but we need the numbers because just because something's a good thing, it seems to be incredibly difficult to get people to do it, whereas they they need numbers. So, um, with the with the particular difficulty I, uh, is in, in the case of the kelp that the kelp clearly um, soaks up carbon, uh, clearly quite a lot of it. But the kelp is essentially a deciduous forest. It's an algae which which uh, 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 which declines seasonally, like a deciduous forest. So where do where do the leaves go? Well, where does that go? Well, some of it floats away into the sea. Some of it lands up on the beach. Farmers used to put it in the soil uh, as fertilizer. Does that happen anymore? Don't know. It's just with kelp, it's extraordinarily difficult to know where the carbon goes. Uh, with other things, it's much easier. With with the actual sediment that is churned up by trawling and dredging, um, it's much easier to say where it's going, whether it's in the water column, whether the water column releases it into the atmosphere, um, how uh, animals in the sediment um, pull down the the, 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 these, um, the latest parcels of, of carbon and turn them and bind them into the seabed. And that's a really fascinating process that almost nobody has really looked at until now. And as it's obviously uh, out there in the continental shelves of the world is doing a huge amount um, to uh, stabilize the climate every day, and yet we don't know the numbers. So we got um, a very large insurance company called Convex uh, to pay uh, a very for a very large research program about carbon seabed carbon, um, which is called the Con- Convex Seabed Survey, and and is basically the largest project we've ever done and and they are looking at that now and and they found all sorts of of animals that are particularly good and some that aren't very good in, in the sediments for for actually pulling down carbon and this whole process the the sea the oceans ability to to pull down carbon 
and the uh, the nature-based solutions that we might uh, resort to, which are a lot easier than any of the other things we're trying to do. Um, and in fact, we don't really know how we're going to achieve net zero very easily, but the, the, the sea, sea has been left out. So we need to understand these things. We need to uh, favor these nature-based solutions if we are going to stabilize our climate. We're only scratching the surface, really, aren't we, in terms of what the ocean can actually do to help? Just starting. I mean, I remember, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I was a reporter putting um, climate change um, stories on the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Indeed, I put the first uh, a, a, a big ones in the 80s when Mrs. Thatcher uh, made a speech to the Royal Society saying we'd We'd, we'd undertaken a, 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 a gigantic experiment with the climate, with the planet itself, um, and, and I, I got that on the front page. No other paper splashed on it. Um, I, I, when when that all that happened, I said, "Well, what about the sea? Oh, the sea is our biggest carbon sink. Well, how does it do it?" And and for about twenty years, I thought it was in some way sort of chemical, but actually, the sea uh, is animate, um, apart from um, obviously. Um, phytoplankton, the, the the plants of the, the vast the vast areas of the sea, um, a, a grow phytoplankton, but everything else is is an animal that eats phytoplankton. That something it then eats it, and it then drops to the bottom or um, forms a a a a a, 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 cal a, 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 a some calciform a, a, a structure of, of uh, a skeleton um, and drops down uh, or is eaten by something else, which we take out of the sea. So, you know, there's a, there's a huge process there that people haven't properly looked at. And I, I, I like this one figure, which came from a Yale paper, which is that, that fish, like whales, uh, absorb carbon and indeed are carbon. And, and they're more efficient than whales because there are more of them than whales. And, and they... Um, they absorb twice the uh, carbon emissions of the EU 27 every year. And yet we don't manage them for profusion. Uh, we take a hell of a lot of them out of the sea very wastefully. Um, we burn some of them to, to, to make um, salmon feed and um, or cook them up. And, 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 you know, this whole process is not done in the foreknowledge that, that, healthy fish populations are stabilizing the planet which they are it's it's highly highly unsustainable isn't it the whole if you every aspect of it seems to me having read your book having listened to you just now we are primitive in the way we catch our fish process our fish uh, decide and regulate which fish and how much and how many we catch it really is in you know, we're in a massive need for, for a huge overhaul. Um, just going back to the salmon, um, we ask our, our guest, Charles, um, a couple of questions. It may sound pretty rudimentary. If you had a billion dollars, euros, pounds, whatever, an ins insurmountable amount of money, uh, what would you do with it to help mitigate the uh, drastic demise of the Atlantic salmon? I hope enough is being spent on science and the as i say the 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 warming of the north atlantic and warming of the north pacific both seem to be producing uh results which show de massively declining salmon populations in both areas so because it's happening in two oceans i think somebody ought to be spending some money on it i'm not sure we're spending enough um and then i would look at some of the the extractive um activities whether whether um other uh industries are compromising the salmon's ability to to survive um i would be much more likely to spend that money on law because i don't think there's ever been a proper uh litigation from a wild system against a salmon farming uh a company um personally a blue marine foundation is opposed to uh, salmon farms in uh, marine protected areas they really ought not to be there they should get out now um so some law might be needed um and some law also possibly uh to define the responsibilities of of uh 
of other extractive industries, such as trawling and, and pelagic uh, pelagic vessels, pelagic um, purse seiners. Um, you know, whose fish are they catching? Um, are they catching salmon and smolts or, you know, and if they are, um, get the hell out of there, be somewhere else. Law and science, I suppose, I've, I've fritter my uh, billion away on, on a combination of the two. What, Charles, if you had no money, and this is, I suppose, we're saying to people who are listening to this, what can people do today, tomorrow, next week to try and make a change? Well, I think support organizations that you are convinced have an impact. I think quite a lot of organizations don't have an impact. Um, in in terms of politics, you, you vote for people you believe in, if you possibly can, whether they get in or not, it's another question. But but in, in terms of supporting organizations, NGOs, um, support the ones which have, have an effect. Uh, that's what you can do without any money at all. But it'd be nice if you had some money because... Um, you could donate it. We... <laughs> We, we 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 exist on donations. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean that's interesting. NGOs, uh, you know, we're we're constantly stressing how important NGOs are, especially in the current climate with regards to this this word apathy we keep coming back to, and how important it is. So so we do stress to to anybody that's listening, uh, whether it's about salmon or or whether you're just interested in what Charles has had to say, please do go and have a look at the Blue Marine Foundation because it really is doing some extraordinarily progressive work and does need your support. Final question, Charles, just to just to hopefully lighten the mood somewhat. Uh, you're an angler, which is I don't know whether you still fish. Do you still fish? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to give you a, a free pass here. Uh, the, the rivers are in pristine condition to varying degrees. Certainly not as as compromised as they are now. Salmon rivers, I'm talking about, and it's your last day on earth, and you have a choice. You could go anywhere in the world, fish for salmon. Uh, where would you go, and who would you go with? Well, I suppose I would go back to where I always started, really. I'd go back to the Welsh Dee, where I caught my big salmon that led me to think why the other big salmon weren't coming. And while I would probably not catch anything if I went fishing for a day on the Welsh Dee, because you, I've spent an awful lot of days not catching anything, it's a lovely river. And I would probably go with my great aunt, um, who's 96, who's seen the, that river in longer uh, for a longer time than anybody else I know, and um, who has caught a few salmon herself. Um, I think one would go back back home. Charles Clover, it's been fascinating talking to you uh, in terms of your work with the Blue Marine Foundation. Keep up the incredible work. I also would highly recommend for anybody to read Rewilding the Sea, End of the Line, but especially Rewilding the Sea in the sense of it's a solutions-based book. It's not doom and gloom. It's not glass half empty. It's saying, yes, there's problems. Yes, there's issues. But we have addressed them in certain areas, in certain ways. And this is how we think it can be done. So highly recommend it for anybody listening. Do check it out. Um, and there's some great ideas. And it, it opens your mind up to the possibilities, I think. that's the To me, that's the beauty of this. It's the possibilities of what we can achieve. We could do a lot of this. We've done some really big things. And um, just... To throw that ambition at some of the other things we need to do. Coming up in the next episode of The Last Salmon, we have Michael Frodin, the Swedish salmon Svengali. He's the king of salmon anglers. And I think it's about time we, we spend a bit of time with an angler. Don't you, Dara? Yeah, Mikael takes us to the riverbank. He talks about, obviously, activism, talks about conservation. This is Mikael, obviously, who is so involved in that, whether it was the dams, whether it's fish farms, but... By God, he gives us some great advice and tips for fishing uh, salmon, and it's well worth the listen. You'll actually learn a lot if you're going to be going to the riverbank soon. I had a fish in Leeds uh, in Russia a few years back. It was, what was it, 42 pounds, full of sea lice, male, fantastic. I was uh, by myself, and uh, that was a pretty cool fish to catch. I've been having days when you catch at 30 in the morning and uh, 30 at night and next morning you think oh that was a fantastic day and you go out and you catch another 30 pound listen and follow on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to give us your feedback rate and review we want to open up the salmon discussion to you and keep fighting for the salmon
May fly time is the pinnacle for most brown trout anglers and we're pleased to announce our next Ireland on the Fly Masterclass is focusing on May fly tactics with international angler, guide and renowned fly tire Jackie Mann. On Thursday the 25th of April at 8pm, Jackie will be discussing how to make the most of the conditions, the best flies and methods to use, as well as giving his tips and insights from a lifetime of experience. So, to join us for this masterclass on Thursday, 25th of April, just go to www.irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass. Tickets cost 10 euros and all attendees will get a copy of Jackie's notes as well as access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And stay tuned for our masterclasses throughout 2024, covering salmon, rivers, locks, streamers, lures, dries, everything to make you a better salmon or trout fly angler. Helping you to catch more this year, and to learn from the best. For more information, email us on info at irelandonthefly.com.